and we'll then uh, decamp upstairs in order to have some refreshments, a glass of wine, a few nibbles, where I hope you'll be able to engage Rupert in further conversation. Um, we've got uh, some of our staff members here very kindly, as always, uh, Mac, who will uh, deal with all your, uh, all your requirements. Um, if you stay beyond 7 p.m., and we hope you might, because you'll be having a good time upstairs, do please find a member of UCL to let you out through that door, because you need a start card to get out, uh, or a super card to get out after 7 p.m. Please don't uh, either break the fire alarm or uh, jenny open the door with the tools you might have about you, because that's inconvenient for everybody. Okay, so, um, with no further ado, I'm going to get straight on with the talk. Um, it's an enormous personal as well as a professional pleasure to welcome Rupert here this evening. I've known Rupert for a long time. We worked together at Forum for the Future shortly after it was set up uh, by me and two colleagues, uh, Jonathan Morrow and Sarah Parkin, in 1996. And Rupert and I ran a very successful sustainable economy unit. And one of the great themes of the Institute of Sustainable Resources now is green economy. And I think the ideas that Rupert and I um, pioneered in those years, what, um, 15 years ago, <coughs> from, um, yeah, uh, are being taken forward in the work that we are doing now. Um, Rupert was uh, an accountant and he turned his hand <coughs> in the Sustainable Economy Unit some really influential work on uh, natural capital accounting, as it is now called, um, and produced a very influential document on the accounting for environmental costs. He then went off to be Chief Executive of the Marine Stewardship Council, which is a job he's been doing for some time. It is, in my view, one of the most uh, important and influential private sector initiatives uh, that are seeking to um, attain uh, more sustainable stewardship of natural resources. And it's that experience that Rupert's going to talk to us about tonight. So, Rupert has, you're very welcome. Well, thank you. Gosh, 15 years ago, it seems like a long time. And actually, uh, I worked for uh, four years before that in Ainsley Street at the International Institute of Environment and Development on sustainable agriculture. So I've sort of shifted from agriculture to the broader sustainable economy and now focusing on, on the seafood. Um, what I want to do over the next 40 minutes or so is to give you an introduction and some background and an overview of the work of the Marine Stewardship Council. Marine Stewardship Council is the world's leading certification and labelling program for wild capture fisheries. But before I kick off, can I quickly just do a sort of complete unscientific, unrandom sample test of how many people had heard of the MSC before you saw the flyers for, for this event? Pretty much everybody. Um, and have you, are you aware of the logo? You've seen that little blue eco label. Okay. Show of hands again. Okay, pretty much everybody. That's really encouraging. Um, don't say what logo that is, but who recognizes that one? Two, one, two people. Anybody know who it is? Uh, United Colors of Benetton. Okay, again, without shouting out. That one? Six or seven people, Nestle. And that one? Okay, about a third of the room. Santander. I'm really gratified by that because we're an underfunded small British charity with no marketing budget whatsoever and we have 100% recognition in this very diverse audience. So that's, that's tremendously encouraging. Okay, why are we here? What's the problem? Um, in my mind, there is no doubt that the state of the global fisheries is perhaps the biggest sustainability challenge that humanity faces after climate change. About 2 billion people depend on seafood for their only or their main source of animal protein. Demand for that protein is increasing exponentially and we're going to have another 2 billion mouths to feed before the end of the century. The UN uh, FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, their latest uh, statistics indicate that 83% of assessed fishery stocks around the world are either fully exploited which means that they are being fished as hard as they can be. There's no further room for, for further extraction of uh, fishing resources. 
over-exploited, depleted, or a few of them in a fragile state of recovery. We've passed peak production of about 90 million metric tons of uh, seafood being extracted from the oceans every year. That's a five-fold increase from where we were in the 1950s. And it, 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 you know, in a nutshell, we have too many boats chasing too few fish with better and better technology at finding those fish uh, and capturing them, and them very, very effectively. So it's imperative that we manage what we've got left uh, on a sustainable basis for this and for future generations. Um, as the slide says, downward trend in some of the top species, bluefin tuna is, is uh, virtually commercially extinct. I'm sure you've all heard the stories of the first bluefin tuna every year being sold at Skitchy Fish Market, sometimes for over a million dollars uh, for one fish. It's quite remarkable. Uh, the same applies to other top predators like marlin and um, swordfish. But not all, well, not all fisheries. There are very well-managed fisheries out there. I'll come on to talk about that. Um, it's not just the sort of state of the actual fisheries. Um, poor fishing practices have a detrimental effect on the marine ecosystem, whether it's uh, bycatch of unwanted species of fish, uh, marine mammals, or birds. And there's also benefit impacts uh, on the habitat, depending on what gear type of, of being used. A problem as well, uh, on the high seas in particular, uh, is, the, is the challenge of pirate fishing. Uh, you know, pirate vessels basically predating on, on fish stocks uh, with no management whatsoever, uh, having a significant impact. Uh, and clearly, it's not just an environmental challenge, it's, it's a sustainability challenge. 200 million livelihoods around the world depend on, on this industry, uh, and as we've said, it's an important part to play uh, in terms of global food security. Uh, this slide is out of the University of British Columbia. Uh, estimates of what the biomass was in the 1900s in the, in the Atlantic. So you can recognize the UK here, Spanish coast, uh, US eastern seaboard. 10, 11 plus tons of, of biomass uh, per kilometer squared in the ocean. And uh, according to UBC, that's where we are after 100 years. So as I said, this is very much about managing what we've got left uh, uh, for the future. It was the collapse of one of those fisheries, the iconic Grand Banks cod fishery, uh, that led to the creation of the Marine Stewardship Council. Uh, the Grand Banks cod fishery is incredible. You know, the Basque fishermen were going out there and feeding Europe in the Middle Ages before uh, Columbus got to America. Uh, a lot of people have written about it when the early explorers got there. They talked about putting a bucket down and you lift it up and it'd be full of the massive mature cod. Uh, this is an incredible resource. And sail went to steam, went to diesel, the technology improved, uh, uh, the science was ignored, and that fishery, uh, uh, they, they kept on fishing till it collapsed, and eventually the Canadian government had to close the fishery. And there's a very famous footage you can find on the internet of the Canadian fisheries minister being harangued uh, by among the 40,000 fishermen that lost their livelihoods when they closed that fishery. And it's never opened. Uh, you know, the ecosystem's flipped. Uh, it's now the got of corn and lobster, which the fishermen are quite happy about. But the cod fry now, there's so few of them, they're being predated on by the crustaceans, and uh, consequently that cod fishery, apart from a few central fisheries, has not come back. So, at that time, Unilever, uh, who owned brands like Birdseye, Gordon, uh, Igloo in, in continental Europe, they were the biggest purchaser of frozen seafood. And for them, it was a wake-up call. Um, you know, if we don't manage this resource sustainably, we have no future business, we have no profits, you know, no Captain Birds, no Captain Igloo. So for them, and I think this personifies a lot of sort of business thinking on sustainable development, it was enlightened self-interest. We have to manage this resource sustainably. And they teamed up with WWF, the world's largest uh, international conservation organization, to create the Marine Stewardship Council. And we were modeled to a degree uh, on the Forest Stewardship Council, which had started about three or four years previously. And the idea was to, to create a market-based program, something that would work in partnership with industry, with government, and with the NGOs, to use the market to create a mechanism for well-managed fisheries to demonstrate their sustainability to the market. But critically, by working with all of those partners, as you, as you try and make them create a market that increasingly demands traceable, sustainable seafood choices to create the demand pool and the market incentives for other fisheries to improve the way they fish the oceans. So it's really important to say, MSC is just a tool. We have one tool in the toolbox, a certification and labeling program to reward and incentivize the sustainable management of the oceans. We need good public policy. We need public policy reform. 
we need the work of the advocacy groups to raise awareness of this issue. And then a market-based program, I think, can complement uh, delivering those sort of public policy outcomes we all want to see in terms of sustainable oceans. So we have a vision of healthy and productive marine ecosystems where seafood supplies are safeguarded uh, into the future. So we're very much about people, food, and the environment. Uh, and for now, we're actually looking at this, but for now, our mission uh, is to use our third-party certification labeling program to enable fisheries to demonstrate their sustainability, and importantly, to empower consumers, all of us, as individuals, to make the best environmental choice if we decide to eat seafood, and therefore sort of reward those fisheries that have met the standard. If we have time at the end, I can sort of talk about where we're moving um, in terms of our thinking uh, about further evolution of the program. Um, we were, WWF and Unilever were sort of having their discussions in the mid-90s. The organization was established in 97. For two years, it really was just a secretariat uh, that developed a standard for environmentally responsible and sustainable fishing uh, based on the United Nations Code of Conduct for Responsible Fishing. Um, we then were launched as a fully independent, uh, non-profit organization in, in 99. So we've been running now uh, as an independent entity for about 15 years. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, um, we have grown, and you'll see on the graphs in a moment, we've grown significantly. Whilst people might have seen the MSC logo in the sort of more developed markets in North America and Europe, really we've got a pretty low profile, um, but we are operating now in 15 countries. We have 15 offices around the world, um, uh, with products actually available in over 100 countries around the world. Importantly, though, it's important to remember we are the standard setter. And that standard was developed over that two-year period by engaging with industry, again with government and with scientists. Uh, and it looks at the health of the stock, the wide environmental impacts of the fishing industry on the supporting marine ecosystem, and the quality of the management regime. Uh, there's a lot of detail there I've deliberately not gone into, but we can do if you, if you want this, we come to questions and, and, and uh, discussion. We've developed the standard. Um, we actually have two standards. Uh, we have a chain of custody standard. Uh, that means if anybody wants to use the eco label in the marketplace, there has to be full traceability from the fishery all the way to the restaurant or to the supermarket. And that is critical because fraud in the seafood industry in terms of labeling is, is, is quite common, uh, whether it's species, country of origin, or weight. And whilst no system is 100% foolproof, the MSC system gives that added assurance that you can trace that, whatever it is you're buying, uh, all the way back down to the fishery where it was actually caught. So we've developed those standards. We conform to all of the sort of international best practice requirements. A separate accreditation body, ASI, Accreditation Services International from BON, accredits independent certifiers. They could be anybody, uh, Bureau of Veritas, Moody Marine, SGS, um, around the world and, and as, as to their professional competence to uh, apply our standard. And even then, it's a team of independent scientists that those certifiers pull together that actually do the assessment. And the assessment is entirely based on evidence and science, a high degree of uh, transparency, everything goes on the web, a uh, high degree of stakeholder input. Stakeholders can even comment and uh, raise objections to the assessment team that are pulled together. Uh, all the evidence used to score a fishery has to be publicly available. Um, even then, there's a separate peer review by a separate bunch of scientists. And even at the end of all of that, stakeholders who've been involved can still raise an objection saying they disagree with the recommendation for certification. And there's a whole separate uh, semi-legal process of an independent objections review. It does mean the program is thorough. It does mean, compared to other shortage mechanisms, we are relatively expensive. Uh, but that's based on the fact that it's the most credible and robust. Um, it can take anything from nine months, is about the shortest time for a fishery assessment. Uh, a few years ago, some of the fisheries actually took about 10 years. Uh, they were really the outliers. We've now tightened up our rules that it's a maximum of, of 18 months. Uh, but it shows the depth of, of, of what the scientists go into and what's actually required. So if you go onto our website, you can go on the track of fishery, pull down reports on things like the US pollock fishery and find a 700 page uh, report with, with a lot of science and evidence. Um, <coughs> so, where have we got to uh, in 15 years? Uh, one reason why I'm perpetually jet lagged and exhausted is that the growth rate has been quite amazing, it's staggered us. 
And this graph shows the uh, engagement of fisheries over the 15 years since we've been operating. Uh, these fisheries have come into the assessment process um, and are ultimately being certified. And we've got to the point now that we have, this is a little bit out of date, nearly 10 million metric tonnes of that 90 million metric tonnes that are being pulled out of the oceans every year, either certified or under assessment. Uh, and when you think that nearly a third of the, of the wild capture goes straight into the fish meal, uh, we've got an even greater percentage of the fish that actually ends up uh, in, uh, for human consumption. Um, I cobbled these slides together literally in the last hour and a half from four people's, uh, including some of my own slide decks. So, I don't normally go for this fancy animation because I'm stuck with it, but I wanted to, I mean, that, the years are clicking by. I wanted to show this to you because it's one of the challenges for the MSC. Whilst I think we're increasingly effective, it's incredibly challenging to try and operate a, a global organization that's trying to engage with the global industry, with large scale fishers and with small scale fishers. And as this map shows, we've got a concentration in, in Europe, particularly uh, Scandinavia, America, some engagement now in Latin America. We have a small office in Cape Town that will engage in Namibia and, and Mozambique and, and South Africa. Uh, quite a lot in Australia. Interesting engagement in Japan, actually. I'm always fascinated going to Japan. We opened an office in Tokyo five years ago. Whenever I go there, uh, the quality of the media interviews is unbelievable. I mean, there's an absolute thirst for knowledge. And when I'm interviewed, they want to get right down into the nitty gritties of the principles and criteria of sustainable fishing and what does indicator 1.1.23 mean, and etc. etc. Very informed. And what the hell I have that? Um, I think that's because the Japanese have a, a they, they recognise that the sort of importance of seafood for democracy culturally, but also the growing scarcity uh, as the Chinese middle class uh, expand. And a lot of fish that used to go into Japan is now being sucked into China, and we're even noticing that in Europe, actually, that a lot of the seafood that previously was coming to Europe would get better prices in China, and actually that's got quite serious implications for a program like the MSC, if there's less interest in sustainability and the sort of opportunities a marketing and certification program like MSC uh, can deliver. Uh, so, um, the reason for showing this slide is again, in, in the early years, MSC was criticised for really being engaged with large-scale fisheries. We now have a very active developing world program, uh, reaching out to small-scale uh, developing world fisheries and large-scale. This fishery is actually the uh, first one in Vietnam that got certified, the Ben Tree Vietnamese uh, Clam Fishery. And again, it shows the relevance uh, of the MSC program uh, at all scales. Um, there's often a lot of confusion about what is a fishery and what's assessed. So again, I brought this in from somebody else's presentation. UK, North Sea. Um, so the unit of certification, what, what are the certifiers actually looking at? It has to have a species. So in this case, the mackerel. Uh, it has to have a fishing methodology. You know, it could be trawl, uh, hop, long line, mid-water trawl, bottom trawl, whatever it might be. Um, it has to have a location, in this case the North Sea, and it has to have a defined client group of every vessel that's part of that assessment uh, actually named. So that is a unit of certification. And then the assessment team comes along, and for principle one, which states that the stock must be managed in such a way that it doesn't lead to depletion or overfishing, they clearly have to look at the entire stock, irrespective of the unit of certification of the vessels that are being assessed. They have to look at the entire fishing effort and pressure on that stock. You clearly can't have a subcomponent of a fishery that's sustainable if it's operating within an overall unsustainable fishery. And that's the bit that I think you know, people sadly get very confused about when they're buying local, it must be sustainable, it's just come out of the channel. I know the you know, fishermen in Brixham, it could still be the last fish coming out of the channel, even if it's local. And small isn't always beautiful, I've learned over the last nine years in terms of fisheries management. Principle two, though, is concerned about the wider environmental impacts of that fishery on the supporting marine ecosystem. And again, it's a lot of economists in the room, you know, all activity has, a or has, a, has an impact. And MSC, again, based on the sciences, it's not saying there has to be no impact. It's saying that impacts have to be within ecological limits. You can have a bycatch um, of unwanted species. 
uh, but it has to be within the carrying capacity of that population. It cannot be having a detrimental impact on the functioning integrity and resilience of that population. And that's what they test, but much more at the, at the vessel level, the, the unit of certification. And then, um, so that's principle two impact. And then principle three again is looking at the overall quality of the management regime. And our standard requires a management regime that is able to respond to new information and to take action that's implemented. Um, so, you know, it might be climate change impact. And actually, that's, that's very pertinent for, for the mackerel fishery. Um, MSC certification, uh, the, the, the fishery is assessed, as I said, typically now nine months to 18 months. A certificate is awarded for five years, but every year the scientists go back to make sure the fishery still meets the standard. And uh, we recently had a situation with climate change where the mackerel fisheries, we had six of them in the North Sea, uh, all around Scandinavia uh, and Scotland. They've been swimming north because of warming waters. Uh, they've swum into Iceland, Icelandic waters and the Faroe East waters. And um, despite the fact of a coastal states agreement with Norway and the EU and uh, an allocation of 645,000 tonnes of mackerel, Iceland and the Faroe have been taking mackerel out of quota, um, sort of verging on the political and the allocation, so we stepped back. But our certifiers said, to breaching the scientific recommendations now, all those certificates have been pulled. And in a way, that's how the program has teeth. Now, understandably, for clients who spend a lot of money to achieve certification, it could be anywhere from 50,000 euro to maybe 250,000 euro for a very large fishery. They've seen that fishery certified and then decertified through action that they had no control over. Interestingly, there's an ongoing debate now with uh, Iceland, Ferries, Norway, and, and, and the coastal states in Europe to reallocate that quota, with, because not least the, the six certificate holders are very, very keen, particularly in Scotland, uh, to, to win those certificates back. Um, because I haven't really talked about the business benefits, but for many fisheries, business benefits of certification are, on the one hand, demonstrating your sustainability through a third-party science-based audit, but frequently it's about getting preference in the marketplace. It can generate price premiums, um, and uh, so, you know, access price premiums and, and new markets as well. We can't guarantee that, but you know, with the world increasingly saying and uh, looking at all aspects of, of um, sustainability, uh, and when it comes to seafood, more and more market players demanding sustainable seafood choices, MSC is generally seen as the most credible and effective way of demonstrating that. So anyway, that's the unit of certification. So on the one side, MSC is trying to operationalize a model of sustainable production. We're encouraging fisheries into a transparent process, evidence, assessment, making improvements where needed to achieve that standard. The call to encourage fisheries in is the growing market demand. And not surprisingly, the, the product slide matches the supply side. When I joined MSC, the, the, the biggest challenge was, you know, we go on to retailers and talk about doing the right thing and you must preference MSC certified seafood. And they go, well, there's the rock lobster in Western Australia, and they're 15 pounds each. Uh, there's a fish called Hokie in New Zealand that no one's heard of. There's the humble Thames herring, but there's only three of them. And what was the other one? Alaska salmon. Uh, and on the whole, we, we were buying farm salmon in those days. And so we suffered from no supply, no market, no market, no supply. And sort of in about 2004-05, the major breakthrough was the Alaska pollock fishery becoming certified. Uh, at the time, it was the biggest <coughs> white fish fishery in the world, ran about 1.3 million metric tons. And as soon as that fishery became certified, I think it gave, particularly in Europe, a lot of the retailers the confidence to say, actually, we're going to start building this into our procurement guidelines. Uh, and then a real game changer was when Walmart uh, announced in 2006 that they would only source uh, fish meeting the MSC standard uh, within five years. Now that was a game changer. I mean, love them or hate them, that was a real leadership initiative. It was incredible. I, I went out to Bentonville in Arkansas for a one-hour meeting in October 05, sat down and talked about, you know, it's a very similar presentation, actually some of my slides haven't changed that much. And they, they said, oh, right, so with MSC we get a chain of custody, someone else pays for all the certification, and then we can provide certified sustainable seafood to our market. Yeah, so it's actually a business uh, risk minimization as well for, for, for major retailers. 
And they said, come back in three months. And I came back with um, people from WWF, uh, Conservation International, uh, and various other people. And they, they brought all of their supplies together. And never before had a retailer done that. And brought all of their supplies into one place. And they stood up and said, apply to the oceans, fisheries. We want to be responsible. We're going to leapfrog other commitments. And they said, we're going 100% MSC. And you're going, to, you're going to make this happen in five years. It was all over the trade press, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, because it was a game changer. And uh, it was quite remarkable, because essentially, they required their suppliers to open up their books to say, where's this fish coming from? And typically, the answer would be China. And you know, it took years to drill down, to, to work our way through the supply chains, to work out what fish was coming from where. Walmart decided to sort of delist uh, some fisheries that they really felt really were in so-called bread lists. Uh, but importantly, they worked with others. They worked with a range of partners with other fisheries to improve those fisheries. And that's why I always refer to the Walmart commitment as a leadership commitment. It catalyzed change because the market incentive was very clearly there. If you're not certified, we won't work for you in five years. Now, they didn't quite get there in five years. They still got that commitment, but they, they got about 70% of the way there. Um, and so Walmart are the world's largest retailer, so pretty significant. The other game changer um, was McDonald's. Um, uh, McDonald's uh, in Europe, actually, were using five different white fish species, Baltic cod, uh, New Zealand hoki, uh, Alaska pollock, uh, and um, what else there were? maybe South African hake. Um, so are using a number of white fish species. Uh, McDonald's also take corporate social responsibility very seriously. And in a similar way to Walmart, they basically said to their uh, source fisheries, we really want you to get MSC certification. And I hasten to say they had a very sophisticated procurement policy for a number of years. Conservation International had been advising them. And in a way, there was a progression from them beginning to look at what they were sourcing, asking the questions of where does it come from, how is it caught, are those stocks healthy, to then say, well, actually, let's go all the way to third party verification with full traceability. And so McDonald's made that commitment, and um, in the Baltic, the Eastern Baltic cod fishery was actually having high levels of overfishing. And there were some bycatch issues, and they basically said, if you, if you never sort them out, we're not buying from you. And they didn't, so they stopped buying. And then that was the wake up call for that fishery to work with other partners, and that's the beauty of the MSC program. We're sort of like a brokerage service and give the tools and methodologies for, for people to come together to use to improve those fisheries. Uh, Esperson is their Danish supplier with uh, WWF and I think a group called the Sustainable Fisheries Partnership worked on a fishery improvement partnership with the Eastern Baltic Cod. Uh, the Danish, there's a big factory in the island of Bornholm that employs I think a couple of thousand people and they sort of said to their government, you know, if, if, if McDonald's stops buying Eastern Baltic Cod, there's a lot of Danes that might lose their jobs. That might have encouraged a little behind the scenes government uh, pressure on Poland to talk about some of the illegal fishing that was going on. And all of this sort of came together over a period of years to result in that fishery being certified. And as soon as they did, McDonald's said 100% MSC labeled on every fillet of fish throughout their, th their classification of 39 markets. Again, quite a game changer. And then uh, in the US, a, a few years later, um, they were already sourcing 100% of their fish from, from the US pollock fishery. Uh, and they made the same commitment. So. Um, I have to say, it's, uh, it was quite amazing. I go to America quite a lot, and um, I was walking down Fifth Avenue in New York a month after this, and every McDonald's I went into, <coughs> there's an awful lot of them. It's quite unbelievable how many McDonald's there are. They had posters in the door with the MSC logo on. And the reason why this is important is it raises awareness. Um, I, one of my children came back from McDonald's in, in the UK, and they had placemats. And my daughter came back and said, oh, Dad, now I know what you do. And then she brought back this placement that said, M is for MSC, <laughs> sustainable fishing. It's fantastic, because it sort of raises awareness, gets people thinking about it. And then the hope is that then when they go shopping, uh, whether it's in a restaurant or, or in a supermarket, they'll see that logo, they'll make that connection. Um, this, this slide I pulled from my uh, uh, global commercial director, who's French. He's from a, a fishing area in Brittany. And he's always slightly embarrassed that there's more fast food restaurants in France than any other country in the world. Uh, but again, it's, it's all, maybe, maybe a Ponzi Madoff type scheme isn't the way to describe this, but it was fascinating to see how one fast food uh, uh, player moves forward and then the others follow. So Quick, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and McDonald's 
all now stop and require MSC certification. They all promote it. Uh, it was very, uh, very gratifying for Nicola Gishi, uh, uh, the person I'm referring to, to be in France during the European uh, Cup final to see TV adverts with the MSC logo in the middle of the Cup final, which is again huge coverage and a sort of transition we're seeing in terms of the profile. Um, we're operating globally. Um, despite the growth, uh, there's a huge ecological challenge. And although I'm talking about numbers of fisheries and tons of products, they're only a means to an end. Ultimately, this program is only any good if we really are driving change in the way the oceans are fished. And it's important we measure and manage that. So we're trying to engage globally, and actually, this is, this is quite remarkable. As a certification and labelling program, uh, it took us about 10 years to work out that Marine Stewardship Council meant absolutely nothing to anybody. Um, very Anglo-Saxon. Uh, when we did some research in Japan, we thought it's something to do with the military or you know, the Japanese kind of council, you know, is it government? And so we had this brainwave of actually allowing people to translate the logo in, into their own language. So in France, Pesh du Hav, or I even attempt the Japanese here. Uh, but I think that's helped us actually engage with consumers. And we do not want to compete with brands. We want to be the sort of intel inside, the host brand that supports the provenance message uh, or, or, or the brand of Young's or Bird's Eye or, or whoever it might be. But um, Japan, um, Japan's largest retailer, very, very committed to the MSC. Um, and uh, actively, uh, you know, using their resources to educate their consumers. I, I was at a uh, Japan uh, Tokyo Seafood Show a few years ago, and Eon had half their stand, uh, you know, with, with models of fishing technology, talking about the MSC in a fantastic way, sort of educating people about seafood, uh, you know, some of the challenges of the global seafood industry and the part they were playing by requiring sustainable seafood choices. Uh, interesting, Japan, you can just see in the background, um, they do all of the processing in the retailer, uh, which is quite amazing. So you get an awful lot of whole fish coming in, and then armies of uh, fishmongers you know, processing and preparing uh, you know, chilled and fresh pack. Um, Carrefour are uh, actually the world's biggest retailer. They're bigger than Walmart in food. Um, very committed to the MSC. and. Again, probably really only over the last three or four years, uh, we've tried leveraging um, our resources to actually encourage retailers to invest heavily in promoting sustainable seafood. Uh, and so in Carrefour, uh, through their superstores and stores they have in the Gevleur, uh, every year now, uh, bringing uh, you know, competing brands together to promote sustainable seafood, sometimes having uh, people in store to help explain to customers what this is all about. Uh, the challenge for us in France, though, is, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, in, in southern Europe, if you go to a, a, you know, somewhere in Spain, France, or Italy, you can have 70 species on the fresh case. Um, whereas if you go to Germany, and one reason why we're incredibly successful in Germany is the Germans eat pollock, salmon, and tuna, and herring. That's pretty much 80% of all the seafood eaten, and we've got all of those certified now. Um, which is why when I come on to talk about um, logo recognition, it's very high in Germany. Um, even though we've grown, uh, I, I passionately believe MSC is, is actually underfunded and too small for the challenge that we're trying to address. There is an ecological imperative that we ensure what's left of our global fisheries are managed sustainably. If all fisheries were managed to the MSC standard, I think we could extract more protein from the world to meet growing human needs for food. And that's even more important because if we if we're going to expand production and at least stop it declining further, it means there's less pressure on terrestrial production systems, which have far higher carbon footprints uh, and environmental damage than, than the marine systems for wild capture fisheries. Um, and I mentioned the fact we're quite small, because typically the way we, we, we grow is we sort of I try and find someone who will fund a consultant to be in a country for a year or two. They'll do some mapping. Uh, of, the, of, the, of the fishing industry and the supply chains and the market. And if we're lucky, we'll put one person in that country. So I've got the, Anyan, who's recently joined our team, uh, is in Beijing. She's our woman in China. She's going to sort China out. Actually, we've now got our Carlos in China as well. So we have two people in China. 
and we have Lava uh, Rodriguez in, in Madrid, but once we get people in country, once they start <coughs> engaging, and because we've overcome the supply problem, it's amazing how receptive people are to the MSC message. You know, they want to do the right thing, and uh, many of them do it because they believe it's the right thing to do in terms of ensuring our, our oceans are, are going to be able to supply fish into the future. And actually, this, this slide really illustrates what I mean about MSC being the trust mark. This is a Norwegian Stay, which is a sort of young cod product. Norg is the Norwegian Export Council, the sort of marketing agency for Norway. So they've got their Norg branding, but underpinned by an increasingly globally recognized trust mark uh, to give consumers that traceability and assurance uh, of independent assessment. Uh, closer to home, uh, Sainsbury's absolutely incredible support for the MSC program. Uh, I've always been a shopper in our house, and I, 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 I know I should do it on the internet, but I, I love going shopping every week, not least so I can trawl up and down the aisles and, and see what's there in terms of new products or product for this thing. Uh, I think Sainsbury's had about 150 MSC label products. It's actually quite subtle, so unless you're looking for it, you don't really see it, but um, all of you, I, you know, next time we happen to pass the same, just go in and have a look at it. It really is quite amazing, uh, the coverage there. And it's spinning out indeed into their home delivery. Uh, we're very lucky to get uh, Saatchi and Saatchi. We've got a $500,000 um, uh, pro bono help from them about five years ago to help design some sort of in-store uh, point of sale materials, promotional uh, materials. And what they're trying to capture is abundance. You know, we're not about shutting the oceans down, we're about managing the oceans you know, on a sustainable basis to meet human needs. And so it's that sort of sense of plenty, we can eat fish and enjoy it, we just need to make sure it's sustainable. Uh, sadly, that pro bono ran out a long time ago. Um, how am I doing on time? Because I could, I could five minutes. Okay, right, I'll, I'll speed it up because then there's lots of these. I've got so many stories, but <laughs> this is what I love. I mean, this, this, this is our most recent co-promotion. Um, and the reason why I love this is MSC is about solutions and partnership. That we're about rewarding good practice. You know, we don't comment on fisheries that haven't voluntarily decided to come into the program. And over the years, we've seen sort of people come together that don't normally come together to promote sustainable seafood. So here in Denmark, we've got the entire Danish fishing industry saying we will become 100% MSC certified. And although Denmark is a small country, I think they're the fourth or fifth biggest exporter of seafood in the world. Um, they are slowly getting their fisheries certified. The Danish retailers, uh, Co-op, Supergross, and Vance, came together. They control 90% of the Danish market with eight competing brands. And over the space of, I think, two weeks, they had a, a massive promotion and awareness raising campaign. Uh, and our sort of, excuse the pun, but a rising tide raises all boats. And it raises awareness, increases sales of the fish category, uh, and we believe adds value to, to, to all of those businesses uh, that have got engaged. And it's unbelievable. I mean, you know, we could never afford to do this, but this is a sort of signage in a Danish uh, retail. It's, it's pretty huge. Um, uh, more information. I've talked about chain of custody. Um, I don't think I need to do too much on that. Uh, I think all of that co-promotion helps explain, this is why we're showing those logos in the beginning, why I was so pleased with our scientific survey earlier, why this growing awareness, at least, of the MSC label. Now, I've got to be honest, you know, we're not 100% convinced about our own statistics. What matters is the trend data. And really, I think what we're seeing here is there's awareness. People might not necessarily know that this label is a sustainability mark for seafood, but they've seen it before. You know, and, and in Germany, you know, we've got 55% you know, of German consumers now are aware of the MSC program for the reasons we said. Denmark, we, we do these surveys every two years, so in fact, this year I'm really looking forward to getting the results, um, uh, because I think it's going to show even the higher trends. Denmark, we only had 2012 data, and it's 35% already. But this is a subset of the population. Those consumers buying fish at least two times a month. So it isn't the general public. And to make that point very clear. Um, this slide is really just saying consumers care, particularly in Northern Europe. And I think that's why the MSC model works in Northern Europe, because we tend not to trust governments very much. We trust friends and family in terms of influences on our life and changing our behavior. And one of the key things after friends and family are eco-labels. And that's sort of the engine that's driving MSC. Um, 
I've, I threw this slide in uh, again off somebody else's presentation because it, it's illustrative of where I'd like this program to go. We, we have a critical mass now. Nearly 10 million tons of seafood in the program. The market for labeled product is over $3 billion. And here we have an example of Kaufland, a German retailer. They charged uh, something like half a euro or a euro per kilo of MSC certified fish, generated some funds that they then gave to the Gambian salt fishery to fund improvements in that fishery. And that's a great way where money can be taken from the consumption end, reallocated to the harvest sector, particularly for small scale community fisheries, perhaps in Africa or elsewhere, to fund green improvements to help them on their way to the to MSC. Um, this is my last slide, uh, and I made this point earlier. Um, this isn't about numbers of fisheries or tons or numbers of labelled products. It is ultimately about changing the way our oceans are fished. It's about making sure global fishery resources are managed on a sustainable basis. And I think what motivates the global MSC team is there is a growing evidence base that this is happening. Uh, we've moved from anecdotal stories to hard numbers, peer-reviewed literature that are showing, demonstrating that fisheries are improving the way they fish the oceans. They are reducing their bycatch of birds. They are improving the overall uh, biomass of those fisheries, the stability of those fisheries. And on the business side, you know, it doesn't happen for every fishery, but all the benefits I discussed earlier in terms of access, preference, new markets, and on occasion, a high price premium. So, um, as, as Paul knows from our 15 years uh, acquaintance, I'm one of life's optimists. And, you know, I, 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 I do believe we can harness market forces, we can get those economic incentives right, to ultimately contribute to shifting the entire global sector, global industry, onto a more sustainable footing. And really, um, that's what MSC is planning to do over the coming decades, not on our own, but through the leadership of our partners, whether it's in the conservation community, through the seafood industry. I won't show the film, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Rupert. And um, yeah, I, I was expecting an optimistic presentation, because that's always been one of the characteristics I'd like most about working together. It was a model in, in other ways too. Um, I for some time have had a, um, an aspiration, which I sometimes don't keep, that uh, only 40% of any presentation can be about a problem, and the other 60% has to be about a solution, which you often don't see in sustainability presentation. I think you probably had 2% about the problem uh, right at the beginning, and it's a big problem, and the rest was about solutions and what you're doing about it. So, Inspiring stuff. Let's have some questions and discussion. Yes, if you'd just like to introduce yourself, that'd be great, so we know who's talking, and then we can uh, take it from there. Uh, hello, I'm Arif Abiola, just name other students. Quite stupid. Um, okay, I embarrassingly don't know too much about MC, but just wondering, um, earlier on, you talked about foreign policy, because MC work with government to help foreign policy. It's a good question, if you didn't hear that, it's about, you know, do we engage with government, you know, particularly public policy debates. Um, MSC was created really because of the failure of global governance. So to begin with, no, we didn't really engage much with governments, and I'll be brutally honest, many governments were deeply suspicious of a non-government organisation that they felt was perhaps trying to, at the very least, question, if not influence and interfere with their sovereign right to manage their fishing resources. Over the last 15 years, as uh, I think the sort of business and ecological case has grown, as there's actually a very significant commercial commitment to the MSC, I think governments have been changing their opinion. Um, uh, in Europe now, DG Mare, you know, we frequently interact with uh, the Commissioner, the Director General. Uh, we have uh, unofficial sort of observers from various governments around the world attending some of our governance meetings. So I think, you know, trying to summarise it, I think a number of governments now see that MSC can help them deliver some public policy goals. However, we don't become public policy advocates. You know, we're focusing on celebrating certified fisheries, encouraging them into the programme, but we see ourselves as a complement to the public policy. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, front here. I've been many years in ASEAN, and I'm 12 years in Bar. My friends who uh, are fish buyers in Billingsgate tells me that the majority of seafood that we get in London actually comes 
from off Myanmar coast. The, uh, and I see that you don't seem to have any representation there. Uh, I believe that that area could be very overfished. Is that an area that we'll be looking at in future? Um, it is. I mean, if, if resources were unlimited uh, within our strategic plan, you know, we, we've just opened office in Singapore a couple of years ago, so we're beginning to engage more in Thailand and Vietnam. We haven't in Burma yet, but one of the my, my, one, one of the key challenges is that many of those issues simply are not even at the starting date for an MSC assessment. And I mentioned earlier about the next five years and where we're heading. You know, one of the one of the major areas of the broader sustainable seafood movement now are what's called fishery improvement partnerships. Non-government organisations, or indeed industry bodies, partnering with the fishery to actually actively work with them to make the improvements that they need, we hope to eventually ultimately lead into MSC certification. So, yes, uh, Southeast Asia is very, very important in, in terms of uh, fishery production. We're not strategically engaged, but we hope to be. But one thing we haven't touched on is actually half the fish we would buy is farmed. And I should have said at the beginning, we only deal with wild capture fisheries. Uh, fish that are caught in, in, in the oceans. We, we're not dealing with farmed fish, uh, which production rates are growing exponentially. Uh, and now probably, you know, any, any UK retailer half of it's farmed, but you don't know. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, there's a lady here. Are you still on board? No, you're not. Okay, gentlemen, we're back. Um, Peter Jones from University College London, Department of Geography. Are there any plans to extend MSC certification to cover, for instance, farmed fish? poultry and pork that's largely fed on fish milk derived products so that you can actually go up through the chain because it's likely that that's going to account for an increasing proportion of wild catch of fisheries. Um, I, before I joined MSM, I've been there nine years, uh, the board has debated and probably seven times since I've been here, should we expand the scope to include farmed fish? Uh, I think there's an inherent logic to do that because most consumers do not differentiate far from wild. I, I have to say I do, so I find there's something about eating wild fish that, that appeals to me. Um, however, we sort of stuck to our knitting. You know, we were set up to make a meaningful difference to reversing the decline in wild captured fisheries. Farmed fish is more akin to agriculture <coughs> and uh, it would be a different skill set. In our sort of dithering on, on all of this, um, the WWF and the Packard Foundation funded a, a series of aquaculture uh, dialogues, and they've actually developed a whole load of standards for nine species uh, of aquaculture uh, production systems, and they've now launched what's called the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. So it's only just got off the blocks. Many people see it as a sister organization to the MSC. Their logo is very similar. So there's the ASC doing farm, we're doing wild, but to your other point, I mentioned 30% of the global harvest is, is basically ground up to produce fish meal and fish oil, and we are actively engaging with those fisheries. And um, there's a Peruvian anchoveta fishery, for example, uh, in the Pacific, is, is the biggest fishery in the world. Yeah, and I think it lands several million tons a year, depending on where the El Nino is. Thank you, Peter. You're very modest. Are you responsible for these um, little flies that we've got on our seats? Yes, is, yes. Is this I you? Am. Yeah, that, that is me, yes. Do you want to give us a 30 second commercial? Rupert's given us plenty of commercials. So, uh, okay, uh, yeah, the flyers for the book, it comes out next Tuesday. It's a book on governing marine protected areas. I like Rupert, I've got a fascination with all things maritime and to do with the seas. The book is looking at particularly how we manage these conservation designations for wider, wider biodiversity conservation <coughs> benefits. It includes market mechanisms like the Marine Stewardship Council legal approaches and community-based approaches. So it's essentially trying to uh, analyze different approaches to effectively achieving marine biodiversity conservation objectives. Thank you very, very much. much. So very, very, very helpful bit of, uh, bit of context, yes. I'm Ian David Jordan, I'm a PhD student with the ISR. Um, I really like to eat fish, but usually I only eat it like once or like every, every week or every second. I try to use it, and even then, I mean, I prefer MSC um, sourced uh, fish, um, but I still feel a bit, I still feel a bit guilty because I think, okay, this is perhaps just like the labeling, right? That ten percent of the global fish is sourced according to MSC standards, but there's still like overall demand, like that overall demand. Um, and now I think, like after you said, like okay, like we don't have, I mean, like there's plenty, and we don't want to have this message of like, oh, you should like 
lower your consumption? What should I do now? Because like now I eat like fish every two weeks. Should I perhaps could I perhaps just like follow my desire and eat like fish every second day? And see souls. Um, Personal yeah. lifestyle advice. <laughs> follow your desires was the question. Uh, it's all being filmed, so I better put this up there or whatever. Um, the beauty of the MSC program is even if demand for MSC certified fisheries increases, that fishery cannot go beyond the science in terms of what it's taking out of the oceans. But as demand goes up, hopefully price will go up. And with that, you create the incentives for less well managed fisheries to come into the program. So yes, if you like fish, I'd encourage you to eat it, but I'd make sure you know where it's come from and it's sustainable, and MSC can provide that, that level of assurance. And there's a great example of that, the Alaskan pollock fishery, banning 1.3 million metric tons. Just now, because there's often, you know, people don't want to reveal too much about their business, but we're hearing anecdotally that they've probably had a $200 a ton premium over Russian pollock, which is the same fish, landing about a million tons uh, on the other side of the ocean. The Russian fishery has come into the program. Why? Because the German retailers and German processors are saying, we want MSC certification. If you're not certified, we're going to preference the fish from, from, from Alaska. The Russian fishery has made huge improvements to achieve MSC certification. Um, the, stock, the stock assessment, uh, you know, critical part of the evidence base for scoring fishery, actually you know, wasn't publicly available under, under the Soviet system. But to achieve their certification, for the first time ever, they've had to publish this data. They had to deal with you know, various bycatch issues, and they've improved that fishery. So that's a really good thing. But people like you buying MSC fish and creating that demand pool. I think Nino comes from Germany, you know, so therefore yeah. may personally yeah. be involved <laughs> in some of that little bit of consumer influence. Okay. <coughs> yes, gentlemen. That. Um, over the years, I've just been expanding. Do you just want to? Oh, sorry. Yeah, my name's John. I'm actually part of the charitable Ocean Watch. Um, so over the years, as you've been competitive, we find that the, the, the pressure is from bottom up, as in from customers demanding MSC products, or from business taking them on as a business incentive, and it's a nice, you know, vehicle to get their environment to be friendly as well. It varies. I mean, that's the, the, the one thing about having 50 offices around the world and, and, and having sort of labeled products in 105 countries. It really does depend on which fishery, which market, and, and which supply chain. Um, when MSC first got going, you know, unashamedly, the outreach was targeted at the big retailers. The people who choose choice edit what's going to go into the cabinets that we will then choose from. So it was really the leaders in that industry, many of which did it for broader corporate social responsibility reasons, some because they thought it was a first mover advantage and they might not get a premium in the marketplace. But whatever the motives, you know, you know, and by doing the right thing, theory of change kicks in and, and works. And what we're seeing now is that we're transitioning from a B2B, business to business type of organization, to a business to consumer type of entity. And that's the bit that really excites me because if all of us as individuals say, I'm not going to buy this fish. I don't know where it's come from. Or I'm going to go to your competitor. That's when this becomes unstoppable, and that's when you draw global fishers into the program. Gentlemen, okay. um, Andrew Fluke, by one of the corporations on sustainability management. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of the talk that we put on the two billion pounds to feed by the end of the century. Um, what are the pressures that you see that are going to work against your ability to expand the certification because presumably there's going to be an increasing pressure on a limited resource which is going to strain the existing um, certified schemes. Um, I, th I think the biggest pressure to be honest is um, newly emerging markets growing in the class, sucking fish out of the key markets that are receptive to a UK labeling uh, message uh, mentioned in China, perhaps India as well. Um, I'm not sure I'm fully getting your question. I mean, there will be increased demand on that resource. I actually believe the oceans can sustain a higher yield than they will all manage sustainably. Um, so there's that to counter. Um, and the fact that I think once fisheries are locked into the MSC process, uh, there's, a, there's a built in mechanism to stop them unless they want to be accessible from, from overfishing. I'm not sure I'm really answering your question. But it's just, you know, whether the, the, the demand. Yeah, and the increased local population, particularly given where the 
population which is going to take place is going to be of a sort where it's going to be difficult for you to either maintain or to increase the yeah. certifications and increase the demand for the food as opposed to fishing yeah. in specific. Uh, I, I personally think fishing will become more expensive uh, for that very reason um, and we will probably eat less per capita. Ruben, let me push you on something, then I'll come, to, come down the side here. I want you to be optimistic again, but okay. I want you to be as robust in your science as, um, as I would expect. Um, one of the sustainability messages that I've heard is exactly what you've said there, which is that fisheries are one of the relatively few areas where if we were to get the Sustainability Act together, we could actually support a significant bigger industry globally yep. than we currently have. Um, the statistic I think that comes from Daniel Pauly, which is something like ocean biomass used to be 10 times higher than it is, which that University of Vancouver slide that you showed at the beginning suggests, suggests to me that the ocean could support much more biomass. Yep. And if that was sustainably managed, we could have much bigger fishing industries sustainably fish. Now, are you seeing any evidence for that phenomenon going on round about in your uh, fisheries, um, or is it early days? Um, I, I think the transformation uh, of global fisheries is, is a project of decades. And as I said, you need public policy reform and market-based programs. What we're seeing within MSE certified fisheries is growing stability of the biomass. They're, they're managing it well. They're, they're adjusting the total allowable catches that they're taking year on year based on the evidence and the stock assessments. That's good because it decreases you know, volatility in terms of price. Sadly, globally, the trends are still going in the wrong direction. So um, the FAO figures you know, have actually increased the amount of fishes that they think are fully exploited and depleted. So to answer your question, no, uh, but I remain an optimist. Right, okay, but it, and it remains a tantalizing theoretical yeah. possibility yeah. if we prove that we're intelligent enough um, where we may not uh, we may not manage that. Now, there are a couple of questions down the side. Yes, gentlemen, then they yeah. hey, Hello, my name is Jose. I'm still uh, the Master in Environment Science and Society of the Geography Department. And my question is, at what extent is the work of the MSC related with um, finding new technologies for fisheries, and uh, if you invest in research or, or, or in that kind of things? Um, it's related, but we're not directly involved. You know, MSC, back to my opening slides, you know, we're actually a trusty old standard setter. We have a standard for environmentally responsible and sustainable fishing, but we don't prescribe what fishery management should look like. We don't prescribe what gear type should be used or what particular technology. Uh, because that's not our role. We're there, or rather the, the, the tool is there for, for fisheries to demonstrate and showcase what they're doing. The only two things that we're prescriptive about is uh, the fishery cannot use dynamite or cyanide because it's hard to imagine how those fishing techniques, which are actually still used, um, uh, could actually be sustainable. However, if a fishery is using state-of-the-art uh, gear, um, you know, bottom trawling is, is, is quite controversial for some groups, Industry is not standing still. They're developing new technologies that actually lift the nets off the ground. They're moving away from some of the really heavy beam trawl technology to different gears, and that sort of makes them more open to an MSC assessment. Similarly, with marine protected areas, I think that we all support the idea of, of marine protected areas uh, and, and enclosures. Uh, we can't be prescriptive about that. They might be relevant for some types of management system, and if they're there, the scientists that do the MSC assessment will take note of that, and the fisher will probably get higher scores. Thank you, Alex. I, I was just going to say I looked forward to the day when you would add bottom trawling to your dynamite cyanide, but perhaps I'm out of date already. Is a lady there? Well, that was actually my question. I met a UCL student. If you want to certify fishing methods such as bottom trawling, we do because well, we don't. The certifiers do. We're the standard setter. Um, each fishery is unique, and that's why MSC sometimes has some controversy. You know, some in the industry say the standard's too high, it takes too long, costs too much. Some in the NGO community say the opposite, the standard's too low, 
um, you know, these fisheries aren't sustainable. Uh, we believe it is a robust science-based standard. We estimate only 15% of global fisheries as they're currently managed could achieve that standard. Uh, and in relation to bottom trawling, you know, I would argue that if you've got a sandy bottom in an intertidal zone in an estuary where you might have a six meter movement in, in, um, in sand, what is wrong with bottom trawling? You know, if you've got livelihoods and food and, and, a, and a marine ecosystem that's turning over every few hours. So that's why the specifics matter. The scientists have to come in and actually look at what's going on. In, um, I don't get this wrong, whether it's the New Zealanders or the Alaskans, but one of them, I think it's the New Zealanders, have, have shut 14,000 square miles of ocean kilometers of ocean, uh, but they have bottom trawling fisheries fishing in other parts of that. So there are trade-offs. And then you look at terrestrial farming systems, they will pretty much cloud up everything. So I, I, don't, I don't think we can be as simplistic as banning any particular gear type if it can be managed sustainably. Very interesting. Any other questions coming up? Right there. Got some people up the front. Okay. Thanks, Rupert. Ben Milligan from UCL Law Faculty. My question is about the development implications of certification schemes generally, including market type measures and regulatory driven mechanisms. Um, a potential issue with such schemes is they push the costs of sustainability upstream in a value chain. And obviously, the likes of Walmart like that idea. But it's potentially an issue in places in many parts of the world where the capability to meet the costs associated with certifying sustainability is very limited. So I'd be very curious to hear what MSC's strategy is for addressing that issue more broadly for achieving developing world penetration. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's a great question. Well, I, I challenge, actually, one of the biggest challenges of the MSC is you know, the expectations of all of our stakeholders for us to be all things to all people. And it, it's really, you know, it's, 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 it's a challenge. Um, but to answer your question, I mean, I, I am passionate about engaging more strategically in the developing world because that's where the whole sort of livelihoods uh, you know, aspect and ecological sustainability really is, is much more obvious in poverty alleviation. We don't think the model that we've currently got is necessarily going to fit in Africa or parts of Asia in terms of using the pool, demand pool, and consumer base and labor in the marketplace. So there might be other mechanisms. Uh, and we, we're in the process of developing new tools and methodologies. We've recently developed a, uh, a benchmarking tool that would enable the Fishery Improvement Partnership partners to score their fishery against the MSC standard to see where it is, but importantly, to track progress along the way. And actually, we, uh, we've begun some discussions with development aid agencies to say, could the MSC be used as a mechanism to unlock some development aid channel it into particular countries uh, to actually pay for the improvements that those fisheries need to make to achieve MSC certification. Because at the end of the day, what matters is how the fisheries manage, not whether there's labor product. So we're actively looking at this. Um, we're putting together a big bit for the GEF. We failed to get some big EU funding together. But it's, it's, a, it's a sort of evolution of the program to think about leveraging the sort of brand equity of the program, the science, the intellectual property of the standard, as a mechanism to release funds, not for us, but for you know, real fishery improvements. So for example, Dipigo has special relationships with Sierra Leone. We are now talking fisheries in Sierra Leone. You know, can we somehow link the two together? Exciting. We've probably got a big check would be nice, and then we could do some more. You know, we, we seven hours, 10 not to <laughs> produce <laughs> big checks, but I'd love it to be a first, a first time gentleman here, and then maybe five, that's a great line. I've got a question about scaling up. So eco labels work when they've got scale, but that starting out process, yeah, I'm scared. When you describe it, it sounded to me like you went for five birds. So you know, let's get the stuff in town. What I really want to know is what got the big brands on board in the first instance? So what got you know the, the Walmart, the Alaska Pulp Fishery, the McDonald's on board? Because once you've got them, you know, incremental growth yeah. is much, much easier. Was it personal leadership? Was it fear of stock collapse? What was the, what was the big? Uh, it, it, it's um, again, it's a great, it's a great question because uh, you know, a lot of people say, you know, could, could MSC's model be replicated with, with other commodity groups to sort of catalyze change? And uh, to answer the question, I, I think it's a bit of everything. Um, I think uh, it, it's been MSC outreach staff engaging with key players, explaining what the problem is, explaining the solution that MSC provides, often very cheaply. 
And I think leadership amongst these entities, I mean, the people at McDonald's, they took a risk. The guys from Walmart really took a risk. We were doing commercial outreach and fisheries outreach, but it took the breakthrough of the Alaska Pollock fishery coming in. Why did they come in? Maybe because their biggest customer was, at the time, Bird's Eye Unilever. So you know, the vision of Bird's Eye Unilever with, you know, with WW, it, it all helped. And as you say, once you get a first breakthrough, then things tend to slow down. Happy to discuss that further. Okay. They did that. We, we don't. Um, you just want to repeat the oh, question, because some people may not have heard that. Absolutely. The, qu the question was, uh, <coughs> when, when the independent scientists are doing the assessment, do we capture any data on carbon, carbon footprint? Uh, and as Paul alluded to in the introduction, so I was really interested in sustainability accounting and, and gap analysis uh, that we used to do. We don't. Um, it's, it's primarily focused on the ecological sustainability of the fishery and the wider environmental impact. Uh, a chap called Professor Ray Hillborn has done a huge amount of work on this. So if you Google him, you'll find this. And he's got a lot of data that really shows seafood has a tiny carbon footprint in relation to other proteins, even when it's flown around the world. It's, it's relatively low compared to sort of intensive uh, terrestrial you know, protein production systems. OK, well, that's more or less an ideal seminar finishing time. A little over time to show that the discussion has been great, uh, but uh, not cutting too much into our refreshment time. I'm going to thank Rupert, not just for coming here. Um, we have a vibrant PhD uh, program at the Institute of Sustainable Resources. You've heard from Nina, who's uh, studying corporate um, aspects of sustainability, which I guess is why he's here. We've got uh, Irene at the back, who comes from Vietnam. And she particularly is going to spend a few months at the Marine Stewardship Council. Uh, her PhD topic is on the sustainability of the marine, uh, marine environment with a particular focus on fisheries. Fascinating that you've opened your first uh, sustainable fishery in Vietnam, or off Vietnam, I guess. And, and I suppose Irene will be, uh, will be interacting with that. So um, it's great when organizations like yours, real world organizations, are able to give a kind of practical grounding to the kind of MSC students who we get, who are fantastic. Um, and we'll make good use of that opportunity. So thank you for that. But thank you, above all, coming here, giving us of your time, and explaining the very exciting work you're doing. Thank you.